Hello, I am Lisa Daniels, Executive Director of Windustry and a Managing Partner of the Midwest Wind Energy Center. Really happy that you can be with us today. The topic of our webinar today is Wind Lease Information for Farmers, Ranchers, and Rural Landowners. This webinar is being produced by the Midwest Wind Energy Center as part of of an ongoing series of work partially sponsored by the Wind Exchange, a program of the National Renewable Energy Lab and the U.S. Department of Energy. The views and opinions of authors expressed herein do not necessarily state or reflect those of the United States government or any agency thereof. Just a little bit of background on the topic for today the topic of wind lease and easement information. This is a topic that Windustry has done quite a bit of work on periodically in the past. We, we did an initial round of work in the early 2000s, and then we updated that work and expanded it in 2006. This webinar is the start of an effort to update the wind lease and easement information that is openly and readily available on our website, which is www.windustry.org. So the information that's there currently on our website is wind energy easement and lease agreement guideline, also compensation packages for wind energy land agreements, and a short document, best practices and policy recommendations, and a, and a bibliography for further reference. This webinar is sort of the start of another effort to update this information and get it so that it is more useful and more current on wind energy easements and leases and the compensation packages and, and different ways to value them. And that brings us to our speaker. Our speaker for today is Brad Haight. Brad is a Denver-based energy lawyer. He works on wind, solar, and oil and gas lease matters. He is also the founder of an enterprise called Lease Gen LLC, and he is one of the principals of a company called Compass Energies. Brad has been in private practice for over 20 years. He has represented landowners and companies in a variety of matters, including development, project sales, wind and solar easement, leases, and options. And he has worked on behalf of both landowners and developers. Brad has been involved with a number of now operating wind projects. In his spare time, Brad says he is obsessed with guitars. He loves to play with his, fam his young family. And he likes to go fishing and he tries to go back to Louisiana whenever he can because the food there is so awesome. Brad, it's really nice to have you with us today, and the microphone is all yours. Great. Hey, thank you all very much. I, I, I appreciate the kind introduction. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Brad Haight. I'm a uh, lawyer by training. Uh, I've also uh, built, well, developed and built wind projects, and uh, uh, currently I'm also working on uh, a business around the idea of valuing for landowners, the revenue stream from uh, turbines that are operating on their property. The, the genesis for this idea started back in 2012. At the time, I was uh, developing wind projects and was also uh, uh, in the throes of, of, of financing and building a wind project. Uh, and so I didn't have a lot of time to commit to the idea, but was, was very much interested in, in it. Uh, and the idea that uh, uh, I became interested in came about when I received a phone call from another lawyer uh, in Colorado where I'm based, uh, and that lawyer uh, was helping one of his clients, uh, a retiring farmer, uh, sell his property on, on which there were three GE uh, 1.6 megawatt, uh, megawatt machines. 
And the farmer wasn't in a position, didn't, didn't care about trying to sever the wind rights, but wanted to realize uh, the additional value uh, associated with the land by virtue of those, those operating turbines. So I, uh, uh, I committed to uh, perform an analysis. And uh, uh, as part of that commitment, uh, I hired a financier and a meteorologist. Uh, and we built a uh, you know somewhat somewhat sophisticated for purposes of the project uh, model, uh, and came up with uh, came up with a valuation, and that valuation was then used uh, by the by the farmer who was selling his land uh, in, in connection with that sale. Uh, I was I was uh, again very much very much interested in the idea, but just wasn't in a position to to pursue it, frankly, because I was I was too busy with other things. But the model. Uh, and the issues really sat, uh, sat sat in my mind for a long time. And then last year, in, in particular, uh, 2014, uh, I committed a fair amount of a fair amount of time and effort uh, to building a much more uh, much more robust model. Uh, but I didn't I didn't do it on my own. And frankly, I, I couldn't do it on my own uh, because these analyses are, are are complicated and they require input from a number of uh, different industry professionals, and and I leaned on uh, other folks in the industry uh, to help me uh, build this model. And I had the model uh, reviewed by these different uh, by these different industry participants, from you know developers and economists to uh, engineers and, and, and financiers, uh, you know meteorologists and power marketers, uh, but, but then also landowners. Uh, uh, before I before I actually launched the business uh, in 2015, I actually sat down with a number of landowners and and with their advisors and their bankers and said, okay, you know, is what I'm doing uh, useful and does it and does it make sense? And we didn't launch uh, until we had gone through that gone through that step. Uh, overall, what, what this ends up being is uh, very much like uh, a comprehensive diligence analysis that uh, a law firm or an accounting firm uh, or both working together, frankly, would, would perform in connection with uh, the sale or financing of a, of a, of a full project. Because, because we're looking at the same things. We're looking at, we're looking at production, and we're looking at threats to that production in, 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 assessing, in assessing value. Uh, this next slide uh, just talks very briefly uh, about, I guess, the five topics that uh, we'll be going through in this in this presentation. Uh, you know, what is this analysis? Uh, when do you do it? I have three examples, I believe, of, of uh, you know why uh, why this is important, uh, and then and then we'll spend the most time, I think, talking about you know very generally what's what's considered uh, in connection with this in with this analysis. And then we'll give uh, we'll give you all that are that are on some time to, to pose questions. You know, for me, uh, talking about you know what this analysis is, it, it's actually easiest for me to say what it isn't. And what it isn't, uh, in my view, is uh, a comparability analysis. And I'm not I'm not saying that a comparability analysis wouldn't have any value or, or any use if if you were trying to determine the value of, uh, of the revenue from the turbines that are on your property, uh, you know there may be some value in understanding uh, what uh, you know additional price was paid uh, on your neighbor's land or in connection with your neighbor's sale, uh, uh, in connection with the turbines, right? But but. Uh, I don't think I don't think comparability analysis can work in every situation, and in fact, I think I think it would be unwise to presume that it can work in every situation. And we'll show you some examples of of, of why that is a little bit later. But but very generally speaking, uh, all projects are different, and they're different in terms of um, the contracts that are in place uh, in connection with the project. Uh, you know, your lease may be very well different and maybe markedly different economically from your neighbor's lease. Uh, the power purchase agreement that uh, supports the revenue stream uh, under your lease uh, may not be the same PPA that's in place in connection with uh, the project that's on your neighbor's property. Uh, 
you know, it may, may also very well be the case that you know there are different turbines on your property than on your neighbor's property. Uh, I know uh, I know of at least one project uh, in my home state of Colorado where you've got uh, at least two different uh, turbine models uh, and and coming from uh, different different manufacturers. You know these these sorts of things are going to make difference uh, are going to make a difference when it comes to uh, when it comes to valuing that uh, that revenue stream, what what we really have, I think, is something that is again less less like a comparability analysis. Although I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't always rule out the idea of a comparability analysis having some application, but I think it's it's less like that, and I think it's more like a business analysis. It's more like an analysis of a contracted revenue stream, and it's more like an analysis of a contracted revenue stream in in uh, a somewhat dynamic uh, and highly regulated uh, environment. So so when do you do it? Well, uh, here's a list of of, of seven uh, cases where I think it may be appropriate uh, for you to perform this perform this analysis. Uh, the first, obviously, would be in connection with with a property sale. That is. If you are selling your land, which which is encumbered by a wind lease or a wind easement, uh, you're not in a position to, or simply don't want to, try to sever the wind rights. Well, if you want to realize any additional value associated with with that lease uh, and the revenue stream from those turbines that are operating on your property, then you need to perform this perform this analysis. If you are on the other side of that sale and you're buying that land. Uh, you're going to have the same interest, uh, although although you're going to be doing it for the purpose of ensuring that you're not overpaying uh, for that for that revenue stream. In in the estate world, uh, you know I can I can see two two areas where this where this comes up. Uh, on the front end, uh, if if you're a uh, rancher with you know 10,000 10, acres of land and uh, 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 an ongoing cow-calf operation, and you've also got, uh, you know, some producing oil wells, and you've got wind turbines on your property. Uh, and if you want to divide your estate, you want to uh, divide your assets amongst your three heirs, you're going to want to understand what each of those assets are, are worth. Uh, and it may be relatively simple uh, to do, uh, uh, to, to come up with valuation for the cow-calf operation. Uh, you know, it may be relatively simple to come up with an analysis that would give you a valuation of the uh, oil and gas revenue. Well, now you need to do the same in connection with the wind to make sure that the uh, distribution amongst your heirs is going to be is going to be equitable. In in the case of uh, the administration of an estate uh, uh, in connection with the final return, again here. Uh, I think it's I think it's going to be important uh, to come up with a valuation of this element of the of, of the estate. Uh, more and more now, uh, at least more and more over the last several weeks, uh, I've received calls about uh, wind rights sales, or you may want to call them wind rights uh, severances. In in these situations, uh, third party with no connection to the project to the land. Uh, in some instances, depending on what the lease says, depending on what the applicable state law says, uh, you know, a third party may be able to buy that revenue stream. And you as landowner may have an interest in selling that revenue stream. Well, I think before you sell it, uh, I think you need to understand, understand what it's worth. Uh, I'll guarantee you uh, that if a buyer is knocking on your door and proposing to buy that revenue stream, uh, They'll have a number in mind, uh, and and my experience to date is that uh, that number is not uh, at the same level that I thought I think it ought to be at uh, from the landowners landowners perspective. Uh, I've had calls about uh, divorce situations as well. Uh, obviously, if you, if you've got uh, you and your spouse have turbines on your land, land is part of the uh, community uh, community estate. Uh, you're going to have to come up with a valuation uh, for that revenue stream in terms of in, in terms of the final uh, final uh, divorce settlement. And then, lastly, uh, I would say just just tuck away in the back of your mind the idea of uh, this being useful in connection with a with a financing. 
I've talked with uh, several ag lenders uh, over the past uh, past several months, and, and, and by and large, what I'm what I'm hearing is that they don't lend against this revenue stream. Uh, but but anecdotally, I'm getting some sense that while they're not uh, per se lending against the revenue stream, uh, it may be a useful factor uh, in connection in connection with their underwriting. And, and, and frankly, I think that at some point we will see uh, lending against this uh, lending against this revenue stream. Uh, next few slides, uh, a couple of examples of why this why this is important. Uh, example one uh, is a quick and dirty comparison of the economics in in three different leases for two different operating projects. So if you look at the first column, uh, this is an operating project. I'll call it Project A. And the compensation structure is, as I've set it out here, $1,000 per megawatt per year. Uh, second column, Project B, lease number one. This is also uh, an operating project. Uh, but the compensation terms are markedly different. Now, these, these, these projects actually exist not terribly far from each other. Uh, you can see that uh, there's a significant appreciable effect on value. Uh, as between Project A and Project B Lease 1. And, and the reason is because uh, the compensation rates are so, are so different. Well, also within Project B is another lease. It's, it's, it's what I've called here in the third column, Lease Number 2. And this lease was structured much differently uh, from Lease Number 1 and Project B. Again, the same project, different landowners, different economic terms, and, and the resulting effect is uh, a value that's twice that uh, in lease number two uh, as in lease number one, but again, within that, within that same project. So if you have turbines operating on your property and you are the owner of uh, project B lease one, uh, a valuation or an appraisal that was based on, say, Project A, isn't really applicable to to your situation. And similarly, uh, uh, you have the same with respect to Project P Lease Two. Uh, that isn't a, a, a comparable uh, isn't a comparable analysis for you. Uh, I see Tim's question. Uh, NPV is per megawatt. Yeah, Tim, this is this is NPV based on installed megawatt. And uh, I'll do my best to try to get to these questions uh, as they as they pop up. Uh, James Turney, I see I see your question. I'm going to hold off on that uh, for just for just a bit. Another example of of, of why I think it's important to dig a little bit. Uh, and to perform uh, a meaningful analysis. This, this language, or this, this table, uh, it's actually excerpts from a table from the 2011 uh, Excel Public Service of Colorado uh, resource uh, plan filing. Uh, and what you see here uh, are three wind projects highlighted. Uh, and the capacity value associated with those projects as, as assigned by PSCO Excel uh, during years 2012 to 2018, which is the applicable resource planning period. You look at Pete's Table 1, uh, very, top, very top row, you'll see that they've got a capacity value going out to 2018 of, of uh, 25 megawatts. And if you look at Spring Canyon, uh, the last row in that in that column, you'll see capacity value of, of, of 8 megawatts. What that tells you is that from a resource planning standpoint, uh, going out to year 2018, this planning period, PSCO is, is presuming capacity values or assigning capacity values to these wind projects, meaning that they're expecting to be receiving power from, from uh, these projects. Well, what if you see something different? And in this, in this example from this resource planning document, you do see something different. 
associated with Ridgecrest Wind 1, which is a small, uh, just under 30 megawatt wind project in, in Colorado, you can see that starting in year 2017, 2018, uh, there is no value, no capacity value assigned to that project. Presumably, what's happening is the PPA is expiring. If I'm a buyer and I'm looking to buy ground uh, on which turbines from Ridgecrest Wind uh, are located, uh, I'm not going to be inclined to pay much in the way of extra value associated with those turbines, knowing that, uh, for instance, uh, we're looking at an expiration of the PPA in 2017 and 2018. Now, that wouldn't be the end of the analysis. There, there, there's, there's quite a lot else that would, that would factor, factor into this, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an important point worth noting, and it's, it's something you only get to uh, by digging a little bit in, into the overall uh, regulatory overlay uh, in addition to looking at the, the, the contracts themselves. So, so what are you looking at? Well, you're looking at revenue, uh, and you're looking at the elements of the project uh, that affect revenue. And, and it's, I think it's important for me to, right here, just, just comment a little bit uh, on lease negotiations themselves. Uh, you know, we showed you a slide just a moment ago of, of how lease revenue uh, can affect long-term value. And you can see uh, the meaningful effect that, 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 that comes about when you have uh, less favorable economic terms. I would, I would caution folks uh, that are looking at uh, executing a lease to really think long and hard about what, uh, what the long-term effect of the economic terms that they're now negotiating are going to have on that property. Uh, I, I'm in Iowa uh, this week meeting uh, with uh, farm managers, uh, ag appraisers, and, and uh, you know, farm and ranch uh, real estate brokers. And, and interestingly, uh, what I'm hearing in some instances is that uh, where there are these less favorable economic terms, when they're trying to market and sell these properties, the, the net effect uh, from the majority of the perspective, from the majority of the buyer perspective, is that you know, these leases will have a negative effect on the value of the property. So it's, it's, it's important, I think, on the front end, when you're, when you're, when you're looking at one of these opportunities, uh, to really think long and hard about how that lease is going to affect the overall value of the, of the farm and ranch operation down the, uh, down the road. Uh, what's, what's considered, uh, uh, after my digression here, what is considered, well, uh, principally, again, it's, this is contract analysis. And you start with the contract, and the principal contract that you've got to think about when you're, when you're trying to get a sense of, of the value of this revenue stream is the lease. Uh, unfortunately, uh, no two leases are the same. Uh, and and as, as I showed you in a previous slide, and as I'll show you in the next slide, uh, lease structures uh, vary, I don't want to say wildly, but they vary considerably. Uh, you know, I've got I've got stacks and stacks of wind leases in my in my office, and uh, you know, folder upon folder of wind leases uh, uh, electronically on my on my PC. Uh, I, I I grabbed just a you know sampling of ten uh, when I was putting together this presentation, and uh, what I saw were uh, really really disparate economic terms. Uh, I can't tell you that all these projects were built. Uh, I believe four of them were. But, but take any four of these and look at the economic terms and look how much, look how much they differ. And, and as we showed you in the previous slide, you know, the difference between uh, a, an annual revenue stream of $1,000 per megawatt and, and a 5% royalty uh, uh, is going to be considerable. It's 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 nearly a, a difference in six times in six times in value. So so you know if you again if if you're on the front end of one of these opportunities, really think long and hard about about what that long term value is going to be because because odds are at some point you're going to need to look at it in some context. The the the, the basic lease economics. Uh, aren't the stopping point 
when you're looking at a lease. You, you, you're also, in most cases, uh, going to have to look at what's called the gross revenue definition. Uh, and uh, because lawyers are creative and cute, uh, they sometimes play with this definition. Well, well in, in the context of a wind lease, the gross revenue definition is the basis upon which the landowner's revenue is derived. If, if the landowner's got uh, coming to him or her annually a percentage of gross revenue, we need to know what that, what that gross, gross revenue is. And, and, and so you see multiple different sorts of definitions as to, as to what gross revenue is. No two being the same and, and arguably uh, some being uh, better than better than others. What 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 I've always counseled people to do is is uh, to only accept the gross revenue definition that said gross is gross. That is, if there is payment uh, to you as the developer owner operator, whether it's payment associated with a power sale, payment associated with a curtailment. Uh, payment associated with business interruption insurance uh, that's paid in lieu of a power sale, or payment from uh, a turbine manufacturer uh, in, in, in lieu of uh, payment from a power sale, then that constitutes gross revenue. Uh, not all developer, owner, operator, lawyers agree with that. And so you'll see sometimes within these leases little carve-outs. Uh, and I think the second bullet uh, gives you an example of those little carve-outs, uh, such as you know a carve-out here for curtailment or carve-out for a uh, from a turbine manufacturer. Not necessarily thinking or saying that these carve-outs are going to have an appreciable effect on 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 any one project or any one lease analysis, but they do have the potential of having uh, a, a negative effect, and therefore there's something. That, that you have to you have to think about in connection with these with these analyses. If you've if you've gotten through the lease and you're now into the PPA, uh, and again if you've got a revenue uh, if you've got a, a royalty percentage of the developer's gross revenue, well you need to you need to think about what the power purchase agreement says, and you need to think about it principally because what the what the developer owner operator is paid uh, is going to be the basis of what you're going to be paid. So if you're receiving, you know, three percent of uh, power sales at, you know, forty-nine dollars and sixty-six cents a megawatt hour, looking at looking at the first column here, uh, well, that needs to be known, and you need to be able to forecast out uh, for the life of that PPA uh, how for how long that revenue is going to is going to be in place. What, what, what we have on this, on this slide that I'm showing you now are two excerpts uh, from two different PPAs, both in Colorado. Uh, the excerpt on the right, uh, excuse me, the excerpt on the left is from a 2009 power purchase agreement uh, signed by Excel, Public Service of Colorado. And you can see where the lease rate starts, and you can see where it finishes. The uh, uh, the the excerpt uh, to the right uh, is from a 2011 power purchase agreement signed by uh, Excel Piesco. Look at look at just year one commercial operation year one for both of these, and 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 look at the difference in the uh, in the rate. Uh, I mean, fortunately for the industry, uh, you know turbine efficiencies. Uh, Competition amongst OEMs led to uh, significant reductions in, in, in the rate for this electricity. Uh, and that's fantastic for the industry as a whole. For, for a landowner, uh, I would much prefer to be in that 2009 deal than in that 2011 deal because that difference is going to have a market difference uh, on, on the amount of revenue that I'm going to be realizing over the next 25 years of that project's life. If I'm analyzing one of these situations, I've got to get my hand on the PPA. Or if I can't, I've got to figure out a way to back into what that rate is so that I can understand uh, what, sort of, what sort of revenue I can expect uh, down the road. Looking at, uh, looking at the PPA rate, though, isn't, isn't really enough. Uh, and I realize I say this, this, this a lot, this idea that you've got to dig deeper. Well, 
you actually do have to dig deeper when you're when you're digging into one of these one of these analyses and one of these issues. And and, and the reason is because there are going to be different contract contractual elements within within the different agreements that are going to affect uh, that are going to affect value. What I, what I'm showing you on this screen is an excerpt from that 2011 uh, power purchase agreement uh, that I spoke about on the last on the last slide. This this clause doesn't exist in the 2009 power purchase agreement, but it does in the 2011 power purchase agreement. And what it does is it gives the utility an option, uh, starting in the 15th year of the power purchase agreement, to buy the facility. Now, if I'm a landowner and I know that a utility is going to buy the project uh, and I'm thinking about my future revenue stream, at first blush, I think this is a positive. Uh, and overall, I think it may actually be a positive. And it's a positive because uh, it tells me that power generation from this project is likely going to go for an awfully long time, probably beyond uh, the 25-year power purchase agreement and, and, and arguably probably beyond uh, the project's useful life. Let's say it's a 30-year useful life. But, but as, a, as a paranoid critical lawyer, you, you also look at this and you think, son of a gun, beginning in the 15th contract year, they're going to possibly exercise that purchase option. And when they do, the utility, who is now the purchaser of power, is going to own the project, and they're not going to be buying power. So what does that do to the value of my revenue stream? Right. Well, if, if there isn't within the lease a clause that addresses this issue, that is a utility purchase, uh, then who knows? I mean, I mean, literally, who knows what's, what's going to happen in that, in that scenario? Likely, the utility is going to say, well, you know what, we, we will not pay you uh, as though power sales are going to be continuing because, frankly, there are no power sales at the, at the wholesale level anymore, and we're just going to pay you the minimum. Maybe the minimum is $2,000 or $3,000 per megawatt uh, installed. Likely, that's going to have an effect on revenue, and thus it's going to have an effect on value. Uh, with, with just to this, further on this point, and, and, and for the folks that may be looking at wind leases, uh, uh, for the first time and maybe looking at entering into a wind lease, uh, I would say really think about utility purchase issues uh, in connection with that in connection with that agreement because uh, it's an important piece and, and, and I've been in situations personally where we've had to negotiate around this around this specific issue. Uh, and again, it, it's much better to have done that on the front end uh, than on than on the back end. Uh, Obviously, the lease is important. We look at it. We look at it carefully. You all looking at these issues should be looking at the leases carefully. You should be looking at the power purchase agreements carefully. Uh, the, it's not again your stopping point, though. Uh, I think you ought to take a look at if you can get at the interconnection agreement, uh, especially where you've got a unique interconnection. Uh, that would be, for instance, what what we would call a non-jurisdictional interconnection. That is an interconnection with let's say, a municipal utility or, or a cooperative. The reason I would focus on something like that is because uh, that is not going to be based on, uh, uh, won't well, let me back up. It won't necessarily be based on a FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission approved uh, form. Uh, rather, it may be based on a form uh, that the co-op decided was more appropriate for them or the uh, muni decided it was more appropriate for them. And, and frankly, it may have a term, uh, whereas the FERC form doesn't have a term. That term uh, could affect the ability of that project to continue uh, operating and selling power after the expiration of that term. Uh, you know, similar issues with respect to transmission service agreements. Uh, and, then, and then there are other uh, agreements uh, or, or instruments, documents that are akin to agreements that, that you'll want to think about. Uh, for instance, like permits, uh, avian and bat protection plans, uh, you know, curtailment agreements. You know, any one of these has the potential to uh, affect production and thus potentially 
affect landowner revenue and, and, and value. And that's that's a good segue for me into kind of what else what else you're looking at here. And and frankly, what we're looking at uh, uh, beyond just these these agreements is 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 the production issues. And and you need to look at and you need to think about equipment and you need to think about meteorology because not all turbines are created equal. Uh, you know, if you've got if you've got uh, General Electric, Vestas, Siemens, Nordex, you know, machines. Those are great machines with, with estimated you know 25 to 30 year useful lives. Uh, those machines, uh, I think, I think create a greater long term opportunity, uh, and and you've got stronger OEMs uh, behind them. There's a there's a small wind project uh, outside of uh, uh, well just just in Werfano County, Colorado, and if you drive by it. Uh, you'll see sometimes that only one of three or one of four turbines is spinning, uh, and sometimes I, I, I've driven by and I've actually seen you know fluid dripping down one of the, one of the towers. You know, if, if 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 those are the machines that are installed on your on your on your land, they've got less long-term value, I think, uh, than would say a General Electric, uh, Siemens, the bestest machine. Uh, unfortunately, if you're on the front end of one of these deals, you're looking at a lease. I, I don't think you're going to have any ability whatsoever uh, to tell the developer uh, what sort of turbine he uh, can install. Uh, you may have some ability to to uh, restrict them on turbine size. I've seen landowners doing this recently, uh, but not on uh, not on the OEM itself. Uh, you know, turbines, equipment, meteorology. Those are only some of the issues that that can affect value and revenue. Uh, there are operations-related issues, uh, regulatory issues at various levels, uh, and environmental issues, frankly, that, that, that can affect uh, uh, revenue. The, the most interesting part of all of this to me, frankly, is, is uh, what you do with revenue value and analysis after the uh, initial PPA has expired. Because your 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 intuition is, uh, as as a, as a fan of wind energy, uh, as somebody who's worked in the power sector, your intuition is that this project uh, has value, and and it does. And I've seen studies that have said that a, that a you know uh, a built project, uh, you know, re repowering of a built project is going to cost, uh, you know, ninety five percent of what it's going to cost uh, to, to to start anew. And, and when you're talking several hundred million dollars in project cost, that, that's that's appreciable. Uh, and so you, you you think intuitively that this project is going to go beyond uh, just uh, its initial initial power purchase agreement. And the data that I've been able to collect, uh, in fact, supports that. Uh, uh, the data that I've been able to collect about uh, project decommissioning leads me to think that the great majority of all projects are going to continue beyond uh, either their estimated useful life or or their initial PPA. But the data also suggests that uh, the, the project's uh, qualities are going to affect uh, are going to affect its its its, uh, its its viability beyond that beyond that initial period. Uh, just just one one thought on 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 discount rates when you're looking at these deals uh, i i uh, <laughs> when I'm doing this analysis, I am largely deferring to the landowner who's hired me uh, to help me understand what he thinks about the discount rate or she thinks about the discount rate. Uh, I will tell you this i've I've had uh, bankers tell me that they can see justification for bringing the discount down as low as three. I've had uh, uh, appraisers and farm managers tell me that they've got folks telling them it ought to be as high as 15. Uh, I, I don't know that either of those is appropriate, but uh, I, I think it's a case-by-case -case situation, frankly, as to, as, to, as to what discount you ought to be looking at. Uh, but I think there can be justification for a lower discount rate, given that this is a contracted revenue stream uh, and that the contracts are going to be often between uh, very well rated entities uh, that have proven track records uh, and, 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 and for which there's been uh, significant security posted. Uh, just, a, just, a, just a quick example of, a, of a, uh, three issues that 
uh, you, you need to be potentially well. Let me back up a little bit. Uh, three samples of, of issues that uh, show that there can be uh, effects on value and that you just simply can't take for granted uh, the, the revenue stream in connection with, in connection with a, a lease. So, so this excerpt uh, uh, relates to this excerpt relates to uh, two NextEra projects in, in, in Texas. Uh, uh, NextEra, as you all may know, the, 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 the largest, biggest, most successful developer in, in, in the U.S. They have an extraordinary track record, uh, but their projects aren't immune to failure. Uh, Two smaller, older projects, older vintage turbines, uh, turbines that were probably uh, obsolete or showed no real value. Uh, this project was struck by an ice storm. And, and uh, NextEra said, you know what, uh, it, it's not economical for us to continue this, so we're done. We're decommissioning. We're decommissioning the project. The, the reason I think this is so interesting is, one, because it's NextEra. Uh, and, 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 I, and I think that tells you that you can't presume that the fact of the developer owner operator uh, means that you shouldn't have to look at anything else. Uh, the, the, other, the other thing I think this is meaningful is because uh, I think it shows that where you've got uh, project issues like older vintage turbines, uh, I think you have to take that into consideration uh, when you're doing an analysis of this, of this, uh, of this revenue stream. Uh, example B uh, kind of takes us to the, to the other end of the spectrum, and this is a, this is this is a discussion about a uh, community wind developer and a community project, where simply due to the fact of of, of an administrative oversight, uh, you know, annual filing of uh, uh, FERC's uh, QF self certification form, uh, due to that. This, this, this developer owner operator found itself in a world of trouble. I don't know. I don't know how this played out, other than to other than to point out that this 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 project has found its way into bankruptcy. What what that tells me, if if I'm the critical analyst on this deal, what this tells me is that I need to think about that that operator, and I need to think about its levels of level of sophistication, and its ability to manage these to manage these issues. Uh, the last, the last example uh, relates to a Montana project, uh, very, very large project, several hundred megawatts, uh, sited uh, proximate to Bald and Golden Eagle nesting area uh, uh, in 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 Glacier County. I think it's Glacier County, Montana. I, I pardon the pun. I got wind of this issue uh, before this lawsuit was filed, and so I'd been waiting to see what was going to happen with it. Well, what, what happened with it was the the, the purchaser, uh, San Diego Gas and Electric, actually sued to terminate the power purchase agreement. Uh, I believe, uh, at least through rumor, I've heard that that lawsuit has been settled, uh, and and that's a plus for the project's continuing operation. My suspicion, though, is that there has been some sort of amendment to the power purchase agreement and some sort of uh, uh, curtailment agreement entered, which which is going to affect production. And when it affects production, it affects revenue, and that affects uh, value to those landowners who've got leases that are based on a royalty percentage of, of the developer's gross revenue. What this What this also tells me is that this project, uh, in, in my mind, doesn't have as strong a chance of being repowered or continued after that initial contract period. My suspicion is that San Diego Gas and Electric is going to be looking elsewhere uh, because it's not going to want the risk. Uh, maybe it's a PR risk. Maybe it's a credible legal risk of, of being associated with this, with this project uh, longer term. Uh, because of the project size, you know, maybe we're looking at a, a, a massive stranded asset, you know, 15 years from 15 years from now. I've got a handful of questions here. Let me see if I can read through these. What is the escalator? What does it represent? I, I in the lease revenue comparison, James, that was, uh, 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 I think, 
two percent of, uh, of uh, CPI, the consumer price index, or one of the one of the CPI indices. Yeah. Uh, James, you've got a second question. What is an appropriate starting point for the discount rate uh, in NPV? Well. That's a, that's a good question. I wouldn't I wouldn't actually look to uh, Fed funds prime rate or 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 LIBOR uh, necessarily. Uh, where 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 I've gone for this information is frankly to the to the, to the banks uh, to ask them you know what their thoughts are and and to the landowners uh, to ask them what, what what their thoughts are because again I'm not I'm not approaching this as as an appraiser. Uh, I mean, there are certainly some, some appraisal concepts, I guess, built into what I'm what I'm doing here, but it's not it's not an appraisal, uh, certainly not an appraisal per se. And and what I'm hearing from the ag banks and and from the farmers is that uh, it's 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 you know four to seven percent, uh, uh, and 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 obviously the 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 seller is thinking four percent, the buyer is thinking uh, seven seven percent. It's not my place, I think, uh, operating not as an appraiser to say what is the appropriate discount rate. Uh, uh, it's rather it's rather my thinking that I present this analysis, and, and and anybody doing this analysis, frankly, it's not it's not terribly difficult to simply change the discount, uh, the cap rate, from four to six percent, and get a sense of how that affects how that affects value. Uh, so I'm looking at another question, uh, Karen, that asks, are wind rights real property in a legal context? Wow, uh, that's, a, that's a loaded question. Uh, let me see how I can best answer this. Uh, I think that wind rights, uh, tend to be analyzed and thought about uh, in, in the context of, of, of real property. Uh, and, and, and there are, I think some, there's a statute in Colorado, there are statutes in South Dakota that deal with issues like severance. And I think those are generally dealt with uh, in uh, the real property statutes. And uh, I know that where transactions have been allowed, uh, I, I was I was I was on the phone last week with another lawyer who uh, I was helping to structure uh, a transaction where wind rights were being were being uh, legally severed off the property. And interestingly, uh, uh, what what we decided to do in terms of the transfer instrument was <laughs> to call the uh, the right the wind right that was being effectively severed uh, we called the, the, the instrument a uh, a deed and assignment so so we actually we actually captured kind of both uh, real property concepts with the with the, with the with the term deed and we captured uh, personal property uh, concepts uh, with 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 the with the assignment, uh, James. I don't know. If, I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, um, that's that's about as well as I can do at the moment. I, I mean, I can I can I can get a little more esoteric actually, uh, and and talk about uh, uh, you know other 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 analogies of the comparison of how other folks have. Uh, uh, looked at these uh, looked at these issues. Uh, I'm looking at a question. Assuming that PTC is not removed, renewed, or phased out, how do leases change? Uh, that's uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, uh, I don't know that leases change uh, that much if the PTC is is not renewed or is or is phased out. Let me let me let me talk through this in the context of a phase out first because you know if we were to presume that uh, it's Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton uh, you know vying and uh, you know fighting for the presidency 
uh, you know, Jeb Bush has said he's in favor of a, he's in favor of a PTC phase out. I guess I would presume the same from from Hillary Clinton. Uh, I don't I don't think that the the terms of the lease itself changes, uh, uh, and I say that in part uh, because there is an expectation. Uh, uh, I think now built into the utility world and built into the finance world that these contracts are going to be long-term contracts. Uh, so, so this is how we get to you know 20 and 25 year PPAs. Uh, from the wind PTC side of things, you know if you think about recapture issues, uh, hurdle rates, uh, you know the, the the tax credit investor. Is is you know paid out uh, you know year year ten or twelve of this of this contract, and yet these these contracts are still for twenty to twenty five year terms. And I think I think the reason is because the utilities want that long term long term certainty, uh, and I think they would continue to want that long term certainty given where kind of overall power generation seems to be headed, which is which is in the direction of natural gas. And if you uh, uh, if you are thinking about natural gas and you're thinking, okay, we're going to have a lot more natural gas for our, our generation, wind is the logical hedge. And so for wind to have its greatest potential hedge value, I think it's got to have a longer a longer uh, uh, a longer PPA, which means 20, 25 year PPA, uh, 20, 25 year PPA term. Uh, there's a, there's another question. Does PTC or subsidies factor into gross revenue? No. In fact, there are there are. I have never seen a lease that included uh, any uh, any value in favor of the landowner vis-a-vis -vis the PTC or frankly any any other subsidy or grant. And, and James, to your point, uh, those are always carved out. Nobody nobody is assigning any any value uh, uh, to, to to those to those elements. Um, back to back to the question uh, about Mark. I just I just thought of this uh, about the PTC. How do leases change? Uh, that was that was the question uh, from Mark. Uh, again, I don't I don't know that the leases change, but I think lease revenue is probably better. If 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 the utilities continue to want to buy power, if if they're required to buy power because of the Clean Power Plan uh, or because of their RPS. And if the PTC is phased out, well, if, if the PTC makes up 30 to 50 percent of the overall uh, project value, the only way for the developer to make that up uh, is going to be to raise the rate under the PPA to the utility. Well, if the rate to the uh, utility under the PPA goes from $25 to $45, uh, and if the landowner's revenue is based on a royalty percentage of that, those gross sales, now uh, the landowner is making more money. So the, the, the absence of a PTC is certainly going to affect industry. Uh, uh, I don't know, though, that it's going to uh, cripple industry. Uh, but I would say uh, you, will see, you will see a positive effect on those projects that are built. Uh, without a PTC, presuming there is no PTC. Uh, I have a question from Lisa. Do the developers share the PPA rate they negotiate with the utility? Uh, no, they don't. They don't share that. At least to your, to your point, they don't share that information. Where, where I have to get that information, uh, I either have to wade through uh, Public Utility Commission, Public Service Commission filings to, to find that information, uh, or I have to wade through FERC filings to find that information, or I have to call <laughs> folks that I know uh, that, that, that have information uh, about those rates, uh, or uh, you may have, uh, 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 I'm sorry, I lost my I lost my train of thought on the other other uh, on the PPA rate. You may have other vehicles that, that you can use to back into uh, what that rate is. If if the lease was uh, 
uh, negotiated well on the front end. Uh, it's going to have an audit right built into it, and this is again to the question about what is the PPA rate. If, if the lease was well negotiated, there'll be an audit right, and uh, that audit right will presumably allow the landowner to see the uh, periodic utility statements. And if the landowner uh, is able to see those periodic utility statements, they may show or should show the number of megawatt hours produced uh, associated uh, with the number of megawatts installed uh, and the amount that was paid in connection with that. Well, you can, you can take that information and, and back into uh, a PPA rate. Uh, you'll, for, for that to really provide you meaningful value, though, I think, I think you've got to get as many years of those utility statements as you possibly can. Uh, there are some other guideposts as well. Uh, I think DOE NREL uh, publishes uh, sampling of, uh, of rates as well that you can, you can look to as, as a guidepost. Uh, there's, a, there's a question about deregulated states uh, where utilities aren't the buyer, but they're you know, independent uh, retail sellers. Uh, does this change the land lease? Firstly, is it a land lease? It does not change the land lease. Uh, the utility is going to be allowed to sell to whomever they, or, or, I'm sorry, the operator is going to be allowed to sell to whomever they uh, uh, wherever, wherever they want, uh, and 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 you know that could be uh, that could be that they're selling into the spot market. That's that's a completely different analysis. Uh, there are not many of those projects in existence. They do exist, but that's a that's a completely different analysis uh, from what I've been talking about here. And frankly, I don't I don't know that I have uh, uh, the time to, to 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 walk everybody through that. Uh, that scenario, uh, you know, those those contracts are going to be different. It does change. It will change the PPA, uh, and, and 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 frankly, uh, it's going to be a much tougher exercise, I think, uh, to figure out what overall value is where you've got that uh, where you've got that situation. Uh, where are you headed with handling those surprise legal language risks? Uh, so, so Tim, uh, I, I I look at every bit of you know contractual legal uh, language risk as 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 a possibly having an effect on on uh, on revenue, and it, it, it's it's you know it's the seemingly innocuous piece of, of language that could really have uh, a considerable effect on, on, on revenue. Uh, we don't know sometimes if, if those contractual elements are ever going to be put into effect, uh, but you have to, uh, being conservative, uh, I think you have to plan as though that, that potential exists. I'll give you, I'll give you one example. Uh, and this is, this is in connection with a project we were, we were developing and analyzing and we were working on a, a a power purchase agreement for, and the, the power purchase agreement that we negotiated was going to include a provision uh, uh, by which uh, the utility, if the balancing authority ever assessed uh, a certain ancillary service charge, if they ever opted to assess it, then we as the developer owner operator were going to have to pay that charge. Uh, if if our lease, and our lease did not say this, but I've seen other leases that have said this, if our lease had said that that specific ancillary service charge would be carved out from gross revenue, then uh, if and when that charge would ever be imposed, then it would affect the amount uh, ultimately that the landowner was, 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 going to be, was going to be paid. Again, that, that comes up principally, or that example comes up in the context of, of, of a gross revenue definition uh, analysis. Uh, uh, but but it's not it's not the only it's not the only example of what could uh, what could come up. Uh, you know, if you're if you're if you're looking at a PPA, for instance, and you see that it's got a uh, a cap 
on the number of megawatt hours that could be sold in any in any one year. Well, if if you think the site has greater wind potential than that, well then you know now you've got to, now you've got to scale back on your overall valuation because of that uh, because of that cap. Lisa and everybody attending, thank you all very much. I really appreciate your time. And uh, thank you very much. And we'll be closing for today, but stay tuned. We uh, have not uh, we have not exhausted this topic by any means. <laughs> yeah, great, great. Thank, thank, thank you, you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye now.